Hello and welcome to the class. I hope you and your families are safe and healthy. In today's class, we are going to study a very important topic for the exam, a topic which has been asked by UPSC many times in last 10-15 years. I will show you the questions which UPSC has asked from this topic. The topic I am talking about is the position and powers of President of India under the Indian Constitution. A question which is often asked in the context of President of India is that, is the President of India only a rubber stamp? The reason for this question is that although Article 53 of the Constitution of India has vested has vested all the executive powers all the executive powers of union of union in the president but there is another article that is article 74 which says that there shall be a council of ministers headed by prime minister to aid and advise to aid and advise the president in his executive functions. The question which came up immediately after constitution came into existence was that is this aid and advice binding on the president? If it is binding, does it mean that the president of India has to act even on an advice which is unconstitutional? There were some of these questions which were left unanswered in our constitution. And these answers were left to the future governments and onto the people of India. There are some of the powers in constitution of India which can be said to be the powers which president may exercise in his own discretion rather than on the advice of PM and Council of Ministers. The question arises as to how many of these powers or to what extent, to what degree can the president act in his own discretion, act in his own judgment and not on the advice of PM and the Council of Ministers. Let me show you some of the articles which give some powers to the president, which have some scope for the exercise of discretion and individual judgment by the president of India. The first such article is article 53, which I just mentioned. This article not only vests the executive power of union in the president, but it also makes president of India the supreme commander the supreme commander of our defense forces of our defense forces what are the powers of president in context of defense forces as supreme commander of these defense forces does he have the power to appoint the chief of defense forces the chief of the army staff the chief of the naval staff chief of the air staff does he have any powers in maintaining discipline in the armed forces or even the use of the armed forces? The first such article. The second article is Article 77 which says that the business of the government of India shall be conducted in the name of President of India. That means all the actions of executive, all the actions of executive are in the name of in the name of president next article which has some scope of discretionary powers for the president is article 80 which gives him the power to nominate to nominate 12 members 12 members to rajya sabha from the fields of literature arts science and social service. 
the next article is article 85 and 86 these two articles talk about the summoning of sessions the summoning of sessions of parliament and sending messages and sending messages to parliament that means the president can send his opinion on any matter to parliament in the form of a message next article is article 103 this article gives president of india the power to disqualify members of parliament mps of lok sabha or mps of rajya sabha on certain grounds these grounds are if any member of parliament holds any office of profit if he is undischarged insolvent if he is undischarged insolvent insolvent sorry insolvent if he is of unsound mind if he is of unsound mind or if he is no longer a citizen of india article 103 says that the president shall act on the advice of election commission of india does it mean that under article 103 the president does not need the advice of the pm and council of ministers and he will act solely on the opinion of election commission of india again a question which we have to find the answer for next article is article 111 according to which whenever a bill is passed by the parliament and it goes to president of india he has certain options he can give assent to the bill he can withhold the assent to the bill thereby preventing the bill from becoming act he can return the bill back to the parliament for its reconsideration and when he returns the bill back to parliament he may or may not send the reasons or his objections to the bill and this article 111 implicitly gives the president of india an option of neither assenting the bill nor withholding the assent and simply keeping the bill pending which is famously called pocket veto again what is the scope of article 111 and can the president assent or not assent or return a bill or keep a bill in his pocket without the advice of the council of ministers and the prime minister next article is article 124 and 217 which talk about appointment of supreme court and high court judges appointment of judges the next article is article 143 which empowers the president to consult supreme court to consult supreme court on any matter of law of public importance when president of india uses this article does he use it on the advice of the pm and council of ministers or in his individual judgment then article 316 talks about appointment of upsc chairperson and members so when the president of india appoints upsc chairman and the members again is it on the advice of council of ministers or a discretionary power similarly article 324 talks about appointment of chief information uh, chief election commissioner i beg your pardon as well as other election commissioners and then finally article 352 356 and 360 which empower the president to proclaim three types of emergencies national emergency president's rule which is also called constitutional emergency and financial emergency now these are all some of the articles not all this is, this is not an exhaustive list these are some of the articles where the president has a scope of acting in his individual judgment and these questions were left unanswered by our constitution makers and we will today discuss this topic in great detail along with the intentions of constituent assembly and the debates which took place in our constituent assembly while drafting the Indian constitution. We will also look at the present position 
on this topic and what changes have been made with regard to President of India in the decade of 1970s. Because 1970s is an important decade which marked a change in the position and power of the President of India. It brought some clarity on the powers of President vis-a-vis -vis PM and the Council of Ministers. Let me now show you some of the questions which UPSC has asked from this topic of President of India and his powers. Let me tell you that in last 15 years, UPSC has asked more than five questions from this topic. That means every third year, that means out of three years, in at least one year, you will find a question from this topic. Let me show you some of those questions one by one. The first question is, in exercise of his her functions, the President of India is a mere convenient working hypothesis. Do you agree with this view? Justify your reasoning with illustrations. This was asked in 2012 main examination. Next question. The President of India acts like grandparent in a family. If younger generation does not follow his her advice, he she is just unable to do anything. Comment 2007. We all have grandparents at our homes and they are old. They cannot really run after the grandkids. They can merely warn the grandkids. Better don't do this. Better don't do that. You will hurt yourself. Chot lag jayegi. If the grandkids do not listen, there is little that the grandparents can do. So the UPSC examiner has compared the President of India with that grandparent. Next interesting question. Not the Potomac, but the Thames fertilizes the flow of Yumuna. So Potomac is a river in America. Thames is a river we all know in London, UK. And Yamuna, of course, we all know. So the question is trying to say that the Indian president or the Indian presidency is inspired from British monarch and not the American president. So once you understand this question statement, you have to here discuss the same issue at what is the position of president of India under the Indian constitution. And this question was asked in 2006 main examination. Next question. Comment on presidents of India prior to the passage of 42nd and 44th amendment could afford to be more assertive. And this was 2004 examination. I just mentioned that 1970s decade was very important in bringing some clarity onto the question which we are discussing. That what exactly is the position of President of India? Is he merely a rubber stamp? Is he merely a convenient working hypothesis? Is he merely like a grandparent in the family? So in 1970s, 24th Amendment, 42nd Amendment and 44th Amendment, all in 1970s brought some clarity on the issue and on the same issue, UPSC has asked question. So these are some of the questions which UPSC has asked. I am not showing you all the questions to keep the class brief. So let us discuss this topic today in detail and have complete clarity so that we can attempt any question in any form, whether in general studies or in the optional public administration from this topic. When we discuss the position of President of India, we have to discuss it in context of some important characters, important personalities, because of which this debate not only got initiated, it also brought some clarity or even sometimes confusion. So let us see that who are all the main characters. The main characters, this again, this is not an exhaustive list. These are the main characters because of which before independence, during drafting the constitution, and after constitution came into force, we had this debate on the president of India. The first such character is, of course, Dr. Rajin Prasad. 
he's the first character in this debate for the simple reason that not only was he the president of the constituent assembly but he also was india's first president and that too for two terms and during his tenure it was a time when india became a republic india's constitution came into force india was born as a democratic nation with new institutions new persons of in power new rights to the people of india and india was finding its place in the world map as a democratic emerging nation in those times there was a lot of n- lot of new institutions which were set up by the constitution and there was lack of clarity as to what is their interrelationship what are the powers of these institutions what are the limitations on powers of these institutions and in those times dr rajan prasad was the president of india so he of course is the first character in this debate the second will be none other than pandit nehru simple reason because not only was he the prime minister of the interim government immediately after independence but he will also become india's first democratically elected prime minister his position is also important because we all know that india has adopted a government an executive on the pattern of british parliamentary system in which the prime minister is the real head the real executive whereas the head of state the president is only a nominal executive so after dr rajin prasad it is pandit nehru who will be important in our debate the next person this debate will be dr ambedkar for simple reason that he was the architect of india's constitution he was the chairman of the drafting committee which ultimately drafted our constitution and his views his opinions have shaped the making of indian constitution at every stage the next personality is a great authority in indian constitution and that is ak ayer aladi krishna swami ayer he is well recognized as a constitutional authority he was a lawyer and he was also advocate general of the madras state aladi krishna swami ayer dr b r ambedkar himself once recognized that in drafting of indian constitution there was influence of much greater personalities and one of those were a k ayer this was in the words of dr b r ambedkar and the last such character in this debate of president of india his powers his position in the constitution is sir b n rao sir b n rao he joined indian civil services in 1910 he was knighted in 1938 got the title of sir and later he became the constitutional adviser while we were drafting our constitution so his views opinions advice also influenced the shaping of india's constitution now these were the main personalities who will clarify as to what type of position the president of india enjoys in the indian constitution we will start this topic by discussing first the debates which happened in our constituent assembly because without studying these debates we cannot have a clarity as to what was the objective of samvidhan sabha when they were drafting our constitution with what intentions they adopted the office of president of india and how many powers or how much powers they wanted to give into the office of president of india once we look at this perspective that is the debates of constituent assembly then we will talk about the present position of president of india and will it be okay if we call him as merely 
a rubber stamp an ornamental head a figure head or does he enjoy any powers in the indian constitution now we all know that indian state has also adopted the doctrine of separation of powers so we have three organs of state legislature executive and judiciary before we got our independence a lot of emphasis was given on the institu institution of legislature that when india becomes independent what kind of parliament it will have will it be unicameral or bicameral how will the members be elected will there be any reservation for the minorities if there be reservation on what basis it will be given so a lot of emphasis was given on the parliamentary institution before independence because we indians were desperate for participation in the decision making of the country in law making of the country nehru report sapru report all these reports emphasized a lot on the legislature that what kind of legislature india will be having after its independence and that is why before independence not much attention was given to the type of executive that india will be having after independence so after we got our independence and while we were still drafting our constitution we started focusing on the type of executive that we wanted that what type of executive is india going to have now when we discussed the type of executive we mainly focused on the euro american euro american models that means the models or the constitutions which were working in north america and different countries of europe now in euro american models there are three types of executives which are found the first type of executive is the american presidential american presidential system the second is the british cabinet system which is also called as parliamentary system and third is the swiss elected executive swiss elected executive that means in switzerland the model which was in vogue which was in practice in switzerland now these were the three main models which were discussed by our constitution makers each of these models has its own advantages and disadvantages and please remember that while we were discussing in our samvidhan sabha in our constituent assembly the type of executive we wanted an executive we wanted a government a type of government which was powerful so that india can move on the path of development on the path of advancement progress economic growth so definitely we wanted a government which is powerful yet we wanted a government an executive which does not have unlimited powers which is not unaccountable which is not un which is not answerable so we wanted a government we wanted an executive which is not only powerful yet accountable and answerable for its actions the american presidential system is where the people of america the people of the country it is found in some countries of latin america also the people of the country directly elect the head of the executive that is the president in american system the executive is powerful it is stable but it is not answerable to the legislature to the congress the second model was the swiss elected executive in which the members of the government the members of the executive are from different groups and this model suits because this model gives a stable government with representation to different sections of population and the third model was the british cabinet system which is also called as parliamentary democracy or parliamentary government in this model the council of ministers the cabinet headed by the prime minister have the real executive powers and they are answerable 
they are accountable to the parliament specifically precisely to the lower house of parliament whether it's house of commons in uk or it is lok sabha in india now within the british cabinet system we again have two types of models the first is the british model of course and second is the irish model the british model is different from irish model in the sense that in british model a lot of practices of parliamentary government are only left on conventions the relationship between legislature and executive within executive the relationship between the monarch the head of state and the british prime minister and council of ministers these relationships are left only on conventions but ireland after getting independence from britain it drafted its constitution and converted many of these conventions into many of the conventions they were converted into writing or they were converted into written provisions now when our constitution makers were drafting constitution and they discussed the the type of executive finally we zeroed upon the british cabinet system for the simple reason is that indian people were familiar with the system because some form of the system in limited form was prevalent in india during times of british so it was prudent advisable wise to adopt and continue with the system with which majority of the indians were familiar they knew the system and it even suited indian conditions now once we zeroed upon this system the next question to be answered was ki which type of model is it the british model that we india will adopt in which many of the practices and traditions are left only on conventions they are left on the wisdom of the future governments they are left on the vigilance of the parliament they are left on the vigilance of the people of the country that people are aware they will not allow the government to violate those conventions or are we going to adopt the irish model in which the conventions are going to be converted into written provisions and there are many such conventions if i give you some examples the first such convention in britain which is not written is the appointment of the prime minister we understand that the head of state monarch or in india the president appoints the prime minister but that prime minister should be someone who enjoys majority support in the lower house the house of commons in uk or in india lok sabha now this principle that the pm should belong to the majority party or the group of parties having majority in lok sabha or the house of commons is only left on conventions in britain but should india convert it into writing should we write this in the indian constitution that president of india shall appoint the prime minister only that person who has majority in the lower house first question second convention is that the president the head of state should disclose his financial assets disclose his financial assets so that there are no allegations of disproportionate assets on the president and the president can act without any financial motives while discharging his functions third provision was should the president of india appoint ministers from different minorities different communities and this was a fear in some sections of indian minorities we all know that unfortunately india got partitioned india got divided on the issue of religion so the minorities in india they had this fear that in the independent india are we going to have any place in the policy making and law making of the country so as i mentioned earlier in the swiss model the members of the executive are appointed from different sections of population 
and they have a stable term. So in India, should we also make it a written provision that the Prime Minister, while choosing his ministers and President, while appointing those ministers, should ensure that the major minorities, the main minorities, get representation in the government? Now, this also is a convention in Britain. Fourth convention, that the head of state, head of state, should we limit his term at how many terms he can hold? Can he be president of India for one term only or two terms or three terms? Now, this question became even more important after President Roosevelt, President Roosevelt in America contested for third and fourth term for the president of America. After George Washington, there was a convention in Britain, sorry, a convention in USA that the presidents of USA do not go for third term. But this convention was not followed by President Roosevelt when he contested not only third term, but also fourth term. And that is how later the US Congress will amend the US Constitution and convert that convention into a written provision which now makes one person ineligible to become American president for more than two terms. So even America had to convert that convention into a written provision. So should we also do that? Dr. Rajendra Prasad, when he became the first president from 1952, to 1957, some people expected him to step down in 57 and allow Radha Krishnan, who was the vice president, to become the president of India. But Rajan Prasad contested the second term and he became a president for a second time. From 1957 to 1962. In 1960-61, we again had a public debate that is he going to contest for third term, Rajan Prasad? And this public debate and kind of fear, apprehension was so much that in Raj Sabha, a constitutional amendment bill was introduced to amend the constitution and not allow a person to become president for more than two terms. But eventually that bill was not passed. So it was also, now these are some of the conventions which I mentioned, which our Samvidhan Sabha constitution makers had to discuss, debate and decide that like Britain, are we going to leave them only on the conventions or are we going to convert them into written provisions like Irish constitution. And eventually you all know, what did we decide? We decided to go with the British model and leave these conventions as conventions, unwritten conventions and let us hope that the parliament will keep a vigil, will keep a watch, will keep a close eye on the functioning of the executive. The people of India will be aware and they will not allow the executive, the government, to transgress the powers given to it in constitution and every functionary will respect and follow the conventions. We'll discuss this in detail in, 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 in a moment. Now coming to the executive, the powers of the executive. So as you understand, the state, let me change the color of the pen. So once we decided that what kind of executive we wanted, and that was the British cabinet system. Now in this British cabinet system, the executive has two main parts. I'm not talking about the technical on paper thing, the pra practical executive. First is the President of India. And second is the PM and the Council of Ministers. We all know that the PM and Council of Ministers are the real executive. They are the real executive office holders who look after day-to-day -day functioning of the country day-to-day -day administration of the country, they look after the governance of the country, they look after the policy making of the country, the major policies of the country, and therefore they are the real executive and the PM is called as the real head. However, 
there is again a fear as i mentioned because see this was very natural for we indians to be suspicious of our executive because we indians were ruled for a long time by an unaccountable unanswerable british government so we became the victims of an autocratic executive so it was obvious for us to have a suspicion an element of suspicion towards the powers of the executive so here also i told you our constitution makers wanted to have an executive a type of executive which would be stable powerful so that india can move towards the path of development the government executive can take strong decisions make strong policies yet they were suspicious that what if the executive pm and the ministers they try to have concentration of powers they start behaving in autocratic manner they start behaving in undemocratic manner then how to limit their powers so the title which i have given to this page is you can all can see limiting the powers of executive and by executive i mean the real executive the pm and the council of ministers as well as the president of india we have to limit the powers of pm and the ministers as well as the president that is why in the draft constitution not in the final constitution in the draft constitution some powers were to be given to the president of india so president of india in the draft constitution was having some special responsibilities some special responsibilities and some discretionary powers some discretionary powers so what was the purpose i just mentioned that we wanted to ensure that the real executive the pm and the council of ministers do not behave do not act in tyrannical autocratic dictatorial manner we wanted to limit their powers we wanted to prevent them from becoming autocratic and that is why some discretionary powers some responsibilities were to be given to whom to the president of india something similar was given to let me uh, let me change the color of the pen something similar powers were given to the governor general under government of india act 1935 for example what could be these powers these powers could be to prevent menace to prevent any gross menace to the indian union to the union to protect to protect the financial stability of the indian union to protect the rights of minorities rights of minorities appointment of upsc members appointment of judges cag cag even the election commission members because election commission is very important it has to be an autonomous body for the free and fair conduct of the elections so some of these special responsibilities and powers were to be given to the president for what purpose to limit the powers of the pm and the council of ministers but again there was a fear and suspicion and see you all know that we took almost 3 years slightly less than 3 years to draft our constitution so we had intense exhaustive debates on different provisions of the constitution especially these important provisions again we had a fear that what if the president of india enlarges his powers expands his powers and tries to usurp tries to take over tries to dominate even those powers which are not meant for him which have not been envisaged by the constitution what if he tries to take over and concentrate those powers into his own office into himself that means we have to ensure that even these powers are exercised by the president in a democratic manner and for this purpose sir b n rao sir b n rao the constitutional advisor advisor he suggested a mechanism and what was the mechanism the mechanism was let us have a body which is called as privy council which is called as privy council 
uh, Privy Council you can think of as a body uh, which 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 was found in many uh, monarchies. So it's a small group of people uh, uh, who are very close to the king, the monarch, and they advise the monarch on various matters of the administration. So they are a close group of people around the king. So Sir B. N. Rao advised that let us have a privy council by whatever name it is called. Uh, he proposed the name called Council of State, Council of State, not Council of States, Raj Sabha. Don't confuse. So he suggested a name, Council of State, which is like a privy council. Which will consist of some members. Who all members? It will be Prime Minister plus Deputy Prime Minister. If we have, because Sadar Patel, we had Deputy Prime Minister, but not always. We have had Deputy PMs plus uh, the Speaker of Lok Sabha, the lower house, plus the Chairman of Senate, which is later called as Raj Sabha, Chairman Senate, plus Chief Justice of India. Plus, former presidents, whoever they are alive and active, presidents, plus former prime ministers, plus former chief justices of India. So this body was going to be the advisory body to the president of india in all these functions which i mentioned all these functions 1 2 3 4 5 6 so that again the president of india does not usurp does not concentrate too much powers into himself now this was going to be the advisory body or the privy council but eventually after debate and discussion in samvidhan sabha there was a committee of samvidhan sabha called union constitution committee it rejected this provision. It said this Privy Council will be a kind of a rival of the PM and the Council of Ministers. So he said that uh, the, the committee said that we need not have two rival groups within the executive to advise the president. So president cannot be advised by two groups. One is the Privy Council and second is the PM and Council of Ministers. So there was a fear that if there are two groups, the PM and the ministers, and second group Privy Council, there can be some conflicts. Let us not do that. So the idea of Privy Council was dropped in September 1947. If I'm not wrong, just me confirm the timeline. Yes, September 1947, this idea of Privy Council, it was dropped from the Constitution. Not only the idea of Privy Council was dropped, even this idea of special responsibilities and discretionary powers. Even this was dropped from the constitution. Because the members of constant assembly argued that this concept of special responsibilities and discretionary powers, it reminds us of our colonial past. And these powers were given to the governor general and governors of provinces so that the British can ultimately control the Indian administration, the affairs of India. So they remind us of colonial past, let us not have them in our constitution. So even these responsibilities were taken away from the president. Now, very soon, so in, I told you in September 1947, this idea was dropped. But in 1948, this idea again got revived. And this time it was Dr. Ambedkar who suggested the same idea in a different form. He suggested to have a body called as advisory board. Advisory board. Which will have 15 MPs each from Lok Sabha and Ras Sabha proportionately elected from all the political parties. And they will advise the president on some of his discretionary powers. And he suggested to have this advisory board in the form of instrument of instructions. Instrument of instructions. Instructions. And these instruments of instructions were to be added in our constitution in the form of a schedule. So the way originally we had eight schedules, one of these schedules in the draft constitution was going to contain instrument of instructions 
and these instruments of instructions will provide for setting up a, an advisory board and this advisory board will advise the president of india on some of his special responsibilities and discretionary powers even this advisory board and not just the advisory board the entire instrument of instructions were dropped from the constitution for the same reason that there might be a conflict between advisory board and the council of ministers so the idea was dropped and the instrument of instructions were dropped from the schedule from the constitution because constitution maker thought and dr ambedkar himself thought ki because these instrument of instructions will only be morally binding and not legally binding on the president so let us not have them in the constitution let us not have them just as moral instructions without any legal force so they were removed from the constitution now this is what is the debate which took place in our constitution while drafting uh, which took place in our samvidhan sabha constituent assembly while drafting the constitution now while this debate was going on in 1948 rajendra prasad who was the president of constituent assembly he wrote a letter to whom to sir b n rao to b n rao and he asked him certain questions what questions and why did he write this letter the reason can be because by 1948 there was already a public opinion and consensus that rajin prasad is going to be india's first president so maybe because rajin prasad knew that he is going to become the president so he wanted more clarity on his position and his powers in the constitution now in this letter that he wrote what questions did he ask from b n rao the first question he said that there is no provision in the draft constitution which binds president by advice so he was highlighting the fact in the draft constitution that nothing in the constitution is binding the president to always accept the aid and advice of the council of ministers the second question he asked that is appointing upsc chairman a discretion of the president next question he asked that can the governors withhold the assent to the bills so when the state legislature passes a bill and the bill goes to the state governor can the governor withhold the assent to the bill in his discretion that means the president of uh, 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 i'm sorry he will later become the president at that time the chairman of samvidhan sabha he wanted a clarity not only on his powers but also the powers of the analogous office of governor and the next question he asked if a governor reserves a bill for the consideration of president can president use his discretion in assenting or withholding the assent to the bill these were the questions which he shot to sir b n rao not only this very interesting turn of events so you all know finally india got uh, its constitution it came into force on 26th of january 1950 although some parts of it came into force little earlier two months earlier within two months of becoming the president of india dr rajend prasad wrote a paper and this paper was entitled the title was questions relating to powers of president under constitution of india and in and, and see interesting point is ki it was not clear that to whom dr rajin prasad wrote this paper or to whom was it addressed kiske liye likha tha ye clear nahi tha but somehow the letter it is said that the uh, the paper it reached pandit nehru's hands right and again what were the questions which rajin prasad was asking the first question does constitution of india contemplate any situation where the president has to act independently of his council of ministers so he was asking ki in the current constitution now we have adopted the constitution it has come into force now in the final constitution is there any situation contemplated where the president can act without the advice of his council of ministers the first question the second question what are the implications of the president 
being supreme commander of defense forces of india in regards to appointments discipline and their use so rajin prasad was trying to ask this question under article 53 that if article 53 has given me and made me the supreme commander of the defense forces of india what does it mean does it mean i have the right power to appoint power to discipline the armed forces and their use where to use indian military how to use indian military is it my power now after this paper rajin prasad again wrote a note and this time in september 1951 and you can see this was less than 2 years less than 2 years after our constitution came into force and this time he wrote a note a letter to none other than pandit nehru so he wrote a letter to pandit nehru and the most interesting point is ki when pandit nehru received this letter this note he declared it to be top secret to be top secret and you all know that the state secrets top secrets are protected under official secrets act 1923 and anybody who tries to pass on these secrets reveal these secrets disclose these secrets transfer them to anybody communicate to anybody it is a punishable offense under official secret act so pandit nehru classified this letter this note from president of india rajin prasad as top secret and pandit nehru even shared this note with his cabinet colleagues and requested them also to please keep it as a top secret now in this note rajin prasad was again asking some questions he was again saying something let us see what was he saying the first thing rajin prasad said is that when a bill is passed by the parliament i will act according to the directions of my conscience that means when a bill is passed by parliament and in parliament we knew congress party had the majority so if a bill is passed by the parliament and at that time it was interim parliament because our first parliament according to the constitution was yet to be elected it will come into being in may 1952 and we are talking about 51 so it was our interim parliament so he said ki if the parliament passes a bill i will assent the bill or not assent the bill according to my conscience and let me tell you that why dr rajin prasad was asking this was asking this question from pandit nehru there were two reasons for this the first reason was that hindu code sorry the first reason was that the hindu code bill was introduced in the interim parliament now rajendra prasad uh, by the way hindu code bill those of you uh, do not have idea was regarding the uh, various matters of hindu personal laws like marriages of hindus divorce of a hindu couple uh, inheritance of property all these matters which are personal matters were to be secularized were to be reformed by the hindu code bill now rajin prasad said ki by such a major legislation which affects the masses it should be brought by a parliament which is elected by the people and not by interim parliament so he was not in the favor of enacting this law and that to only for hindus only for hindus by interim parliament he wanted that these reforms in the hindu personal matters they should come after a demand by the hindu community and they should not be imposed by the parliament so this bill was introduced by government in the uh, interim parliament and rajin prasad said ki i will act according to my conscience the second reason why rajin prasad wrote this letter to pandit nehru was the bihar land reforms act the bihar land reforms act this bihar land reforms act was declared as null and void by the patna high court by the patna high court on the ground that it violated the right to property a fundamental right of the zamindars the landlords 
Now, if this was done by all the high courts of India, land reforms would not be possible. So, Pandit Nehru in the interim parliament brought the first constitutional amendment bill to make some changes in the fundamental rights. And Rajan Prasad thought, okay, this is not right. And he believed that the first constitutional amendment bill is against the constitution. And therefore he said, okay, when this bill comes to me, I will apply my conscience in giving assent to the bill. Now Pandit Nehru, what did he do when he received this letter? He immediately shared this letter, not only with his cabinet colleagues, but also to two eminent personalities. And those two eminent personalities were first Aladi Krishna Swami Ayer, which I already mentioned, and second was Attorney General of India, Mr. M. C. Settleward. So Pandit Nehru, on this letter of Rajan Prasad, sought the opinion, views of two great constitutional personalities. A.K. Ayer simply gave a reason, simply gave an answer by comparing Indian president with the British monarch. And he clarified that there is no doubt that the constituent assembly, and see the irony of this entire thing was that Rajan Prasad himself <laughs> was the chairman of constituent assembly. So he was part of the drafting process of Indian constitution and yet so much of confusion and yet so much of uh, lack of clarity on the position and powers of the President of India. So A.K. Ayer replied and gave the reasoning that though no doubt that the Indian President has been modelled on the lines of the British monarch and like British monarch, he is only a nominal head. A.K. Ayer said that maybe the President of India <coughs> has misread the constitution. He thinks that wherever the word president has been used in constitution and any power has been given to him, he has presumed that the power is his power without the advice of the <coughs> PM and the Council of Ministers. This was A.K. Ayer's opinion, which he wrote back to the, to the PM, Pandit Nehru. Attorney General M.C. Settle Ward gave similar reply, but with a slightly different reason. He brought into picture Article 74 and said, Article 74 says that there shall be a council of ministers with PM at the, he at the head to aid and advise the president in his executive functions. So whatever executive functions or powers have been vested in the president, he is supposed to exercise them on the advice of PM and the Council of Ministers and this advice is binding on the President. This was the view of Attorney General. Now after this letter, for some time there was no major debate or controversy on, 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 on such a topic. What exactly is the power of the President? But after some years, in 1960, Rajendra Prasad again fumed up the old controversy, the old question, Fir se vahi sawal. and this time he raised these questions when he gave a speech in 1960 in the inauguration of Indian Law Institute, Delhi. In this speech, he compared himself and his office with directly with the British monarch. He said a study should be done, a research should be done to compare the powers of Indian president with the British monarch. He said, is the advice binding on the president? He said, to what extent can we compare the British system with the Indian system? Because the two systems have different conditions. They have different circumstances. So he was asking and he was pleading for the research on the study of position of Indian president, his powers, the nature of advice given by the Council of Ministers, is the advice binding on the President? Uh, can we completely comp uh, 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 compare Indian system with British system? 
because the two countries have had different historical circumstances, have different current circumstances. So can we completely replicate the British system into Indian system? These were some questions which he raised. Interestingly, after two weeks of, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> after two weeks of this speech, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I got my first vaccine uh, two days back and since then I'm having slight fever and cough. I request all of you, youngsters, please go out and take the first dose of your vaccine. Vaccine, Please don't be afraid and don't go by any any uh, myths uh, going around. And vaccine, Take your first dose of vaccine and, and become safer for yourself and your families, right? Okay. Uh, so after two weeks of this speech, uh, in a press conference, Pandit Nehru was asked, Ki Nehruji, do you uh, know about this speech and was this speech given on your advice, did you prepare this speech? Pandit Nehru replied, Ki we had no idea. We had no clue about this speech until it was delivered. That means this speech was delivered by Rajan Prasad on his own instance, in his own individual judgment, and it was his views. And he was again raising the same questions. So you can, I hope you're getting ki how much lack of clarity we had on the posi <laughs> position of the president his his powers in relation to the PM and the Council of Ministers. Again, we had this issue on a slightly different uh, 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 topic, uh, the same topic, but on a different uh, subtopic, and that was in regard to the power of president in appointing the chief of the defense forces. We all know in Article 53, the president has been given the powers of the Supreme Commander of the Defence Forces of India. Now, in 1961, our then Army Chief, General Kariyappa, was going to, sorry, General Thimaya, not Kariyappa, I'm sorry. General Thimaya was going to retire. General Thimaya was going to retire. Now, General Thimaya, when he was going to retire, he sent a communication to Rajan Prasad, to Rajan Prasad, and he recommended appointment of a junior Lieutenant General, Lieutenant General Thorat, Lieutenant General Thorat, rather than Lieutenant General Thapar, who was the senior most Lieutenant General. So in the Indian Army Defense Forces, there is a convention established that whenever the chief retires, the senior most officer, the senior most lieutenant general or vice admiral in Navy is appointed as the next chief of the staff. So by that convention, and by the way, in our last 71 years, only four times this convention has been violated, sidelined in the army. And the latest one was uh, when General Bipin Rawat, who is currently our chief of defense staff, when he was appointed as the chief of army, he was not the senior most lieutenant general. In fact, he was number three in seniority. So the top two lieutenant generals were superseded and Pranam Mukherjee on the advice of, it was Pranam Mukherjee or it was Amnath Kovin? It was 2017, not sure. So it was uh, on the advice of Mr. Modi that Vipin Rawat was appointed as the next chief of army staff. So at that time, General Thimaya directly communicated to Rajan Prasad and recommended to him to appoint Jeffrey General Thorat, who was not the senior most, as the next chief of army. Now let me tell you here, if something similar happens today in India, if today an army chief or navy chief communicates with the president of India directly, it would be considered as an act of insubordination and disciplinary action can be taken against the officer by the government. So you can understand we are talking about those times when India just got independent. India was a nascent, we were a baby democracy. Institutions just got established. There was lack of clarity of the interrelationships of different organs, different offices, 
who has what power, President of India power, PM powers, ministers, then uh, within the uh, defense forces, chief of the army staff, who can talk to whom, who communicates to whom, who gives orders to whom. So there was a lot of, lot of lack of clarity. But today, things have got settled. Things have got established. So in those days, General Thimaya directly communicated to Rajin Prasad, bypassing defense minister, bypassing council of ministers. Now Rajin Prasad insisted that because I am the president of India and supreme commander of defense forces, I will appoint the next army chief and that will be Mr. Thorat. So Pandit Nehru again had to convince Rajin Prasad and remind him that like British monarch, he is only a symbolic head, a nominal head. In fact, let me tell you something very interesting. Let me take back to the previous slide. Achha, remember this paper? And I told you this paper was written just after two months. After two months of President Rajin Prasad when he became the President. Interestingly, so he became president on, on which date? You all know this was 26th of January 1950 when we became republic. He became president of India. And look at one of the question, this question, number two. Can you see? One of the questions which he asked immediately after becoming president was Ki, what are my powers in relation to the armed forces? regarding the appointments, discipline, and the use of armed forces. So as a result of this, immediately after this letter, the parliament passed the Indian Army Act. Indian Army Act, 1950. It passed the Indian Air Force Act, 1950. And both acts were passed back to back. I think Indian Air Force Act was passed on 18th of May. And Army Act was passed on 20th of May, 1950. Because just before passing these laws, Rajin Prasad was asking these questions. Ki meri powers kya hai? I am the Supreme Commander. I kya kar sakta hun? Defense Forces ke saath. So the parliament, the government immediately tried to contain President of India and contain his powers. And hurriedly, the parliament passed these laws. Anyways, let's come back to the, to the issue. So again on this issue, Pandit Nehru had to convince Rajin Prasad, remind him that he is only a nominal head and appointment of the next army chief is a decision of the PM and the Council of Ministers and not of the President. So I hope you have got some clarity as to how and on what questions we had so much of lack of clarity on appointment of, on, on the powers of President of India. Now, when we talk about debate about the nature of advice, the Article 74 comes into picture. Article 74, which we already have seen, which says there shall be a council of ministers with the PM at the head to aid and advise the president in his executive functions. The question, what is this advice, nature of advice? Is it binding or is it not binding? So in the decade of 1950s, 60s, when we were having this debate, a lot of scholars and experts and authorities, constitutional authorities, gave their views, their opinions, as to what exactly is the nature of the advice under Article 74. Let me tell you some of those views expressed by the scholars, the experts, and the constitutional authorities. First, let us see the views according to which the advice is not binding on the President of India. The first simple reason that it is not mentioned in the Constitution that it is binding. So the first is it is not mentioned in the Constitution. Not mentioned in Constitution. Second, Try to understand this. For a moment, I, I hope you all of you know this, that the President of India uh, can be impeached 
from his office under Article 61, uh, which contains the procedure. And what is the ground of impeachment? It is the violation of constitution. That if the President of India violates the constitution, he can be impeached. Although Article 61 or anywhere in the constitution, it is not explained, it is not defined as to what is the meaning of violation of constitution. As to what actions of president will be deemed to be violation of constitution for which he can be impeached, it's not explained, it's not given in constitution. Now for a moment, let us assume that president of India is always bound, always bound by the advice of the council of ministers. He has to always act on the advice. Now, if that is the case, why have the constitution makers given a procedure to impeach the president of India? Because if president always acts on the advice, there would be no reason to ever impeach the president. Even if any unconstitutional act has been done in the name of president, it would have been done on whose advice? Advice of council of ministers. So is it fair to impeach president for that action? Although it was taken in his name, but he is merely a stamp, rubber stamp. He just merely assented. He just merely signed. So that means that if the advice is always binding, the procedure of impeachment is useless. Why is it given? That means constitution makers knew, they envisaged that in some circumstances, the president of India may act on his own, in his own discretion, in his individual judgment, without the advice of council of ministers, and that action may be unconstitutional. And for that action, the parliament may need to impeach him. This is the second reason why the advice is not binding. The third reason is, scholars said, Ki please look at the word, words aid and advice and look at any English dictionary. By the very nature, by the very literal meaning, these words are not binding. Aid means assistance. Advice means advice, suggestion. So both these words by nature are not binding. So today if I am giving you any aid, any help, assistance or any advice, is it binding on you to accept it? No. Fourth simple reason that advice is not binding because if the advice is binding, does it mean that the president has to act even on an advice which is unconstitutional? If that is the case, we have no reason to blame, to blame for Kruddin Ali Ahmed when he proclaimed internal emergency on 25th of June 1975. You all know, on the evening of 25th of June, 75, internal emergency was proclaimed and for next 21 months, India witnessed a dark period of its democracy. When people's rights were taken away, political rivals were put behind bars without charges, without trial. Even Supreme Court failed to act as the guardian of fundamental rights. Bureaucracy was misused. Police was misused. And for this, everybody blames Indira Gandhi. But ultimately, who signed on the emergency? It was the president. So can the president absolve himself, clear his conscience by giving the argument, Ki what can I do? I was supposed to act on the advice. No. Mr. President, you are the head of the country. You have taken an oath to defend the constitution and therefore you are not bound by the advice. You were at least not bound by the advice which was grossly unconstitutional. So the presidents cannot just wash off their hands by giving the argument that they are bound by the advice even if it is unconstitutional. So the presidents, if not constitutional, at least they have a personal responsibility. They have a moral responsibility to the people of India. These were some of the arguments given in the favor of advice not being binding on the president. 
but there were some arguments given in the favor of advice being binding on the president <clears throat> for example let me give you some of the arguments first very simple that india has adopted a british cabinet form of government or a parliamentary democracy and it is well known that in parliamentary democracy the head of state is only a nominal head whether it is whether it is the british monarch or the indian president or japanese emperor or bhutanese king all these are symbolic nominal heads of states and therefore they are bound by the advice of the pm and council of ministers second advice is that the president president is indirectly elected whereas the pm and most of the council of ministers who are members of lok sabha they are directly elected that means they represent the people of the country so how can an indirectly elected president not act as per the advice of the directly elected ministers who represent the people third reason interestingly the scholars observed that in the indian constitution the council of ministers and the prime minister they have not been given any function they have not been given any power except the function of what to give aid and advice to the president under article 74 that means we all know that in parliamentary system the pm and the council of ministers are the real executive they actually have all the powers and all their powers are written in just one line what to aid and advise the president so this aid and advice becomes so important that it cannot be ignored by the president it becomes binding on the president because if even this function is not binding then technically pm and the ministers have no power in constitution they have no functions in the constitution no function has been assigned to them in constitution because all the powers on paper are of the president whether it they are executive powers or judicial powers or emergency powers or pardoning powers or financial powers military powers diplomatic powers they all belong to the president the only function of the pm and the ministers is aid and advice and therefore this aid and advice becomes very important it is binding on the president i hope you are understanding what i am trying to say and fourth simple reason that under article 361 the president of india enjoys immunity immunity for all his executive functions for which he cannot be questioned or called in a court of law so the constitution makers gave president of india this immunity this protection because they wanted to ensure that the president is not questioned in any court of law for his functions because whatever functions he performs he performs on the advice of pm and the council of ministers these were some of the arguments which were being put forward by scholars by experts by constitutional authorities and simultaneously rajan prasad was asking questions he was writing papers he was writing letters to pandit nehru he was giving speeches in which he was asking questions so finally we will witness a change i hope you guys remember i mentioned earlier in the in the class at the 1970s a major change was made in fact not one major change couple of major changes were made in the position of the president what were those changes the first change was that by 24th constitutional amendment bill 1971 it was made binding on the president to give assent to the constitutional amendment bills that means when the parliament passes a constitutional amendment bill the president shall give his assent and he cannot withhold he cannot do anything else he cannot return the bill he cannot keep the bill pending he has to give the assent that means veto powers of president have been taken away 
in context of constitutional amendment bills. The second major change was made by 42nd amendment, 42nd CAA, sorry this is CAA, CAA 1976 when India was under emergency. So this one single amendment made many changes at one go, in one stroke and one of those changes was made in article 74 and let me show you that change and you yourself observe that change. I am going to show you the original article 74 and the current article 74. So look at the two articles. Yes. So can you observe a change? The change is this word shall. That now parliament has made this change which says that the president shall act according to the advice. Now this change was made when Indira Gandhi was the prime minister and the country was under internal emergency. And during emergency you all know India became Indira and Indira became India. March 1977 Emergencies revoked, elections were held already, the Congress party lost elections, Janta party came to power and for the first time a non-Congress government was formed by Janta government, Janta party and Muraji Desai became the Prime Minister. He brought 44th Amendment, 44th Constitutional Amendment Act 1978 and by this amendment Muraji Desai modified or reversed some of the changes which were introduced by Indira Gandhi by 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976. So you can remember these two amendments as, as each other's counter, each other's counterparts, rivals. So Indira Gandhi by 42nd Amendment brought many changes and some of them were reversed or modified by 44th Amendment. So if 44th Amendment reversed those changes, Muraji Desai could have reversed Article 74 in the original form. But he did not do that. That shows what? Ki whether it was Congress party or any other party, everybody wanted more clarity on the powers and position of the president. And finally, this article was not reversed. However, Muraji Desai, by 44th Amendment, he brought a small change, 1978. He added a bracket after this. He said, provided the President may require the Council of Ministers to reconsider their advice, but shall act according to the advice given after reconsideration. That means if the PM and the Council of Ministers, they give some advice to the President, the President, on any matter, it can be executive matter, it can be judicial matter, military advice, any matter, right? The President can require them to reconsider the advice once. But after reconsideration, the advice which is given it becomes binding on the president. The president has to act on the reconsidered advice. Reconsidered advice. For example, in 1998, Vajpayee government, when Vajpayee ji was the prime minister, he advised President K. R. Narayanan. to dismiss Bihar chief minister and bring President's rule in Bihar. Kya Narayanan sent the advice back to Vajpayee and the Council of Ministers. Next year, in 1999, again the advice was given and this time Kya Narayanan accepted the advice, dismissed Rabri Devi, Rabri Devi as Chief Minister and Bihar came under 
प्रेजिडेंट्स रूल सो आई होप बाय दिस एग्जाम्पल यू हैव अंडरस्टूड कि हाउ आफ्टर फोर्टी फोर्थ अमेंडमेंट द प्रेजिडेंट हैज एन ऑप्शन ऑफ आस्किंग द पी एम एंड द मिनिस्टर्स टू रिकन्सिडर देयर एडवाइस द क्वेश्चन अराइजेज दैट आफ्टर दीज चेंजेस आफ्टर फोर्टी सेकेंड अमेंडमेंट फोर्टी फोर्थ अमेंडमेंट ट्वेंटी फोर्थ अमेंडमेंट कैन वी से दैट द प्रेजिडेंट हैज नाउ बिकम अ रबर स्टैम्प बिकॉज द ओनली ऑप्शन ही हैज इज to require the com council of ministers to reconsider the advice only once only once that's it so does it mean now we can say he is a rubber stamp again the answer is no because there can be some situations some circumstances in which the president may act in his own discretion now these discretionary powers are not given in constitution remember they are all situational they are all circumstantial there can be some circumstances some of them have been some of them can be in future and that is when the president may act in his own discretion so it will not be right to call our president merely a rubber stamp because the office of president is an office of great authority and dignity so the word rubber stamp should not be used for the president of india so let me give you examples of some instances when the presidents may act in their own discretion in their individual judgment without the advice or even against the advice of the pm and council of ministers and again i repeat they are not given in constitution they are based only on conventions only on certain circumstances which are considered as legitimate for the president to use discretion first is in case of hung lok sabha and appointing the prime minister appointing the prime minister so as i mentioned earlier according to conventions the president appoints prime minister and he should be someone who has majority support in the lower house lok sabha it's not written in constitution article 75 only says what president shall appoint prime minister it does not specify who will that person be it's only a convention now as long as when we have lok sabha elections and one party gets majority of the seats it means 272 or more seats in lok sabha president has no choice president has no discretion and only that party's leader has to be appointed as the prime minister but when there is hung assembly hung lok sabha which means no party gets majority for example 1989 lok sabha election 1996 lok sabha election 1998 lok sabha election in such cases the president has discretion as to whom to appoint the prime minister which parties can come together and have majority and form a stable government second if the pm has lost majority in lok sabha and advises the president to dissolve lok sabha president may not act for example if i give you again a hypothetical example it's not that it happened just to explain In 1996, when we had Lok Sabha elections, BJP, for the first time, turned out to be the largest party, but it was not having majority of the seats. So Vajpayee ji claimed that I am the leader of the largest party, single largest party, if not majority, at least single largest party. So allow me to form the government. He was appointed as the prime minister and given some time to prove majority. He could not, so he resigned after 13 days. So in those 13 days, he realized. that he cannot prove majority in lok sabha so what if he advise the president shankar dyaar sharma to dissolve lok sabha and have fresh elections would shankar dyaar sharma have done that no he would not have done that because if the pm has lost majority in lok sabha the president will not dissolve lok sabha on the advice of pm and the council of ministers because president will try to find out if somebody else can come together if two or more parties can come together and form the government and prevent early elections of lok sabha and you all know 
elections of Lok Sabha is a very, very vast exercise. It's a very vast administrative and financial exercise. Right? Third example. Now, remember, according to constitution, the prime minister and all the ministers, they on paper hold office during the pleasure of the president. The pleasure of president. Even civil servants under Article 310 hold office during the pleasure of the president. Even governors. Now, the pleasure of president does not mean that the president any time arbitrarily can withdraw the pleasure and dismiss the prime minister. So as long as the prime minister has majority in the lower house, the president cannot dismiss the prime minister. Even if the prime minister is giving country a bad governance, he is making bad decisions, he is making poor policies, doesn't matter. President cannot dissolve the prime minister. But what if the prime minister loses majority in Lok Sabha? For example, if Lok Sabha passes a no-confidence motion and the PM refuses to resign, for example, for example, in uh, VP, uh, VP Singh, when he was the Prime Minister, he lost no confidence motion. Then Vajpayee Ji, as the Devagoda before him, as the Devagoda, lost no confidence motion. Atal Bihari Vajpayee lost no confidence motion. And thankfully, all the three Prime Ministers honorably, respectfully resigned. But what if they refuse to resign? Then what? Then the president, in his discretion, will withdraw the pleasure and dismiss the prime minister, of course, without the advice. He will not ask the prime minister before dismissing him, right? Thankfully, it never happened in India. It happened in Pakistan, for example. So in 1970, when the elections for lower house of parliament of Pakistan were held, and for the first time, a party of East Pakistan, Awami League, got majority, and Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, an East Pakistani was supposed to become the Prime Minister of whole Pakistan, Western East Pakistan. The people of West Pakistan were unhappy and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was the then incumbent Prime Minister who lost elections, he was supposed to resign. He refused to resign. And even the President of Pakistan at that time, Yahya Khan, supported Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Against this, the people of East Pakistan revolted. There was a rebellion. The West Pakistani army launched Operation Searchlight. They suppressed East Pakistanis. East Pakistanis started coming over into India. Trouble for India. And then story unfolded. You all know that story. Then fourth, such power is the suspensive veto. The suspensive veto and the pocket veto. These two vetoes in India have been used by presidents in their discretion. So when the presidents return the bill to the parliament or they decide to take no action, they do it in their own discretion. Fifth, presidents can send some messages. Sending messages to the parliament. Sixth is under Article 78, the Prime Minister has a duty to inform the President about the affairs of the administration, what's happening in the country. If the PM fails to do this, the President in his discretion can ask the Prime Minister about the affairs of, prime, affairs of the country, administration. Now, these are some of the discretionary powers which are not given in Constitution but they are situational. They are circumstantial. I hope after this class, you have got clarity in terms of both the present position of President of India and the historical debate which took place. To conclude this question, any question on this topic, we can say that the President is not a rubber stamp and he is neither and he should neither be an overzealous interventionist. He has to strike a balance 
between the two extreme positions and he should act as an emergency light. He should act as an emergency light. So emergency light is used when? When the main power is off. When the main power goes off and there is darkness of unconstitutionality, the president will glow like emergency light and that is when he will intervene. That means as long as the advice of the PM and the Council of Ministers is constitutional, the president is bound to act on the advice. But if there is an element of unconstitutionality, the president might use his discretionary powers. So with this, I stop the class for today. Stay safe, get vaccines, take care of your families, the elders of your families especially, and stay indoors unless it is absolutely essential. I'll see you in the next class. Take care.